You're listening to the Teak Nation Podcast, where we strive to educate, inspire, and entertain you with tips and lessons from frauders and friends of TKE. Hello, Teak Nation Podcast. My name is Alex Swenson. Very, very excited to be with you here. It is Tuesday, February 8th. You are probably listening to this on February 9th, February 10th, February 27th. Who knows? Um, glad to be back with you. A couple of weeks ago, we had Frater Ted Barriswell on. Very uh, insightful conversation there. Always good to hear from the venerable Grand Preetness. Uh, this week, something completely different. We uh, have a, a, a Frater on, Kobina and Tiffel. Um, he's going to tell his story, so I don't want to, don't want to get into it too much, but, um, Kobina was, was kind enough and uh, generous enough with his time to be able to share a little bit about what the DEI committee is working on. He's a member of that committee and then talk a little bit about black history month. It is February. It is black history month. And that's something that, um, we value and, and we want to make sure we, we, give the time and, and the energy and the effort to. So um, brought Kobina in to, to share a little bit um, and, and just give his thoughts kind of on Teak and, and the world. And, and again, they'll get into it all. So um, I will shut up. I will turn it over to the interview with Kobina and uh, can't thank you guys enough for taking the time to listen. We are excited now to welcome in to the Teak Nation podcast, Frauder, Kobina, and Tiffel. Kobina, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Alex. Uh, yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Kobina is a Leadership Academy graduate, uh, attended RLC's Conclave, uh, Zeta Zeta Chapter, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and uh, now happy to have him on the podcast here. We're going to talk a little DEI. We're going to talk a little Black History Month and just want to jump right in and, and, and get the conversation going. So my first question to you, Kobina, is, you know, as you think about your level of experience with Teak right now and your level of involvement, how does that compare to where it was when you graduated in 2016? Did you intend to stay involved? I knew you were very active as an undergraduate in the chapter, going to events, but did you want to stay involved with Teak? Did you kind of want to take a step back? And how did those expectations compare to, to where you are right now? Yeah, um, well, a step back, I think DEI means diversity and you know, inclusion initiatives, right? And so, um, you know, to frame it, you know, that that's a big part of, you know, my involvement with Teak. And, you know, getting back to joining the fraternity, Teak has or had and probably still has the reputation of being a majority white fraternity, right? And so coming in, a um, little backstory, I grew up in Ghana, West Africa until about age 11. I moved to Wisconsin to a very white town. That was a little different than Ghana. Yeah, a little, a little different, right? And so I'm used to being, you know, one of one, right? I'm used to being in those settings. And uh, joining Teak was, for me, an opportunity to, you know, build brotherhood. I have one brother, um, and so I was really excited to do that. And talking about the Teak resume, I was also rush chairman, all right? I did recruitment. And you should have seen the fraternity before I was rush chairman and after. I mean, we had Saudi Arabians, we had Serbians, we had... Africans, we had, you know, Hispanics. Um, and I, for me, it was very important to, to have that sense of belonging for everybody. Um, and so my involvement during those days was all about feeling, you know, a sense of belonging with those guys and, and having that community um, to be able to walk around campus, knowing that there was 10 guys deep around the corner of who had your back at any moment. Um, for me, losing my fraternity and losing my chapter was, was uh, a very, very tough thing um, because um, I was actually in the house the night before everything happened. I was there briefly and I, I went off and, and um, I had to mourn the loss of my chapter. Yeah. So leaving in 2016, I had a few years of really harsh and tough emotions around, you know, how I felt about Teague, losing my home chapter. Um, but at the core, one of my values is always to give back. And Teak had has given me so much in my journey to becoming a man, to becoming a leader. Um, the countless mentors I met through, you know, Teak through um, the pivotal moment that Leadership Academy was for me. Right, one of the first moments I was alone with my thoughts and wrote in a book, 
you know, all that happened in Colorado Springs, you know, with, with Leadership Academy. So leaving Teak, you know, an undergrad, I knew I wanted to be a part of it moving forward. I wanted to be a part of it for life at some degree. Um, I just needed time to get to that space. And so you talk about DEI, and I think Chris Nouse has a really great eye for getting people into a room yeah. and reached out to me. And, um, you know, to be involved on an international level is a big honor. I was just talking to, to my girlfriend tonight, and I, I said, you know, their ears must be ringing. You know, I'm, I'm involved now in a couple of different initiatives and it feels good to be back in the fold um, and uh, help out with the story that we're writing as a, as a fraternity moving forward. Yeah, and, and I love that. And I, I want to get back to it. For those who don't know, we obviously don't need to get into it too deep, but you were you're part of the chapter when there was an incident that, that the chapter shut down, which that in of itself is a unique experience, not something that a lot of people uh, have are a part of during their undergraduate years. And so um, it's interesting to just kind of hear your thoughts and perspective on that as, as you go through. And then I, I don't think your, your journey is, is I think fairly common in that people leave and they, um, they need, they need a little break, especially the ones that are hyper involved, right. That are rush chairs and pre, right. You're so involved in Teak as an undergrad, not everyone comes straight onto staff and works for the organization or yeah. dives into a volunteer role. And, and I think that what you said there, which is great is that you, right. You were waiting for the right opportunity. And, and that came when you had the opportunity to apply to be on the DEI committee and, um, and, and serve in that capacity and serve on the, the history traditions and education subcommittee. What, what compelled you in that moment when you got that outreach or when you saw the posting to, to go ahead and take that jump and say, this is the right time for me to get back involved? Well, you know, I've been pretty discouraged in regards to, you know, representation in, in all levels in our society, right? And, yeah. and I work for a Fortune 500 company. So for those that work for big companies, right, in the wake of the last couple of years, there's been a lot of statements made about our commitment to do great things right. and to, to hire more diverse backgrounds and all that. And I, I was in a corporate training recently, and I'm not going to name names or name companies, but I was in a training where I was one out of 40 who was Black. Yeah. In the midst of companies making commitments to diversity, um, the group after me had zero black people. And it quickly became like, wow, like I've spent the last five years in corporate America helping hire black engineers, helping hire Latino engineers and women engineers into organizations. And we're not seeing that change. Um, so that discouragement, you know, led to a conversation with a mentor. And he talked about, Kabina, it's not about where you are right now. It's about what you might be doing for somebody behind you 20 years from now or 40 years from now or 80 years from now. And so that gave me renewed energy. I was like, rather than trying to take on a system that is what it is or a large company that is what it is, what tangible ways can I mentor up and coach up and help the next generation? And so I took that very personally. And, you know, I mentor anywhere from, you know, half a dozen to a dozen college students every year. Um, on top of that, DEI was a very like personal touch approach for me to come in and ask questions and listen and give my feedback on what I thought we needed, right? And, you know, one of the conversations I had with Chris Niles before jumping into my next commitment with Teak was, what does the room look like? Is there diversity of thought, diversity of religion, um, <laughs> diversity of experience, right? Um, so DEI was an easy no-brainer. Um, I think the traditions subcommittee served me well in kind of getting a lot of context I didn't have. I think as an underclassman and as a young man growing up in life, you miss a lot of context. And it's great to have people that have lived the history. I'm not saying anybody's old, nobody come for me, but people that have actually lived through it, they have a higher level of understanding and more depth to share. And, and that was great to be a part of that committee. I want to I want to talk a little bit about the work that the committee's doing and that your specific subcommittee's doing, because I think it most people, most people who follow the fraternity in some form or fashion, right, social media or come to events, they know that the committee was formed and that it is it is working towards certain initiatives. But what is it that that you all are a part of or that you're a part of directly that you're the most proud of, that you're the most excited about? What conversations are you having that you want to amplify out there to the rest of Teak Nation? And are you talking about currently the alumni committee or the the history and traditions? The tr history traditions committee. So history and tradition subcommittee is no longer meeting at this time. Okay. Um, one of the big takeaways from there was really having a hard look at our history as team, yeah. right? Like we have a very glorified approach and, and, you know, anybody that is marketing, you have to sell a good story and you, you know, the truth looks different to different people. And so, 
you know, the, the group did a really good job diving into a lot of different traditions that we've had in our tea culture that may not serve us and they may not have good backstories. And it was really interesting seeing, you know, a word document, you know, generated of all these different examples and these different tangible ways that, you know, we can really um, look inside of our fraternity and organization and say like, we could do better, right? We've never excluded people outright, but there might be things that may not let people feel involved. Um, in the way we've done things. And so that was one tangible thing that we walked away with out of that subcommittee that I was proud of. You know, for me, whatever I'm a part of, I'm always asking, how are we measuring success and what does success look like? And I think in that subcommittee, we did come up with some really good um, items to, to target moving forward. Great, great. I, I appreciate the context. And I know, as I said, I think the listeners are, are aware of, of what's going on, but it's good to hear the work being done. It's good to hear some of the direct outcomes that came from, from some of those conversations. I want to, I want to shift in and talk a little bit about Black History Month. It is February. It is Black History Month. And, and I know that there are a few different things that, that TK has going on to, to help celebrate, but why do you believe it's important that we as a fraternity and really we as a, as a country celebrate Black History Month, and then for those who maybe haven't made it as much of a focus in the past or, or haven't thought about it as much, what are some things that can be done to better align ourselves with some of the lessons in the history of Black History Month? Yeah, so I'll start by saying that, you know, I'm one perspective right. in, in, the, in the ocean Absolutely. of perspectives, Absolutely. right? And the Black experience or the African diaspora experience looks different for everybody. You know, like I said earlier, born and raised in the heart of Africa, transplanted at 11, raised in Wisconsin. I'm very different from a lot of people I come across, right? And my perspective is, you know, there's a very universal element in Black History Month. We all know what it's like to desire belonging. A lot of us struggle with belonging to ourselves, loving ourselves. A lot of us struggle with belonging in our own family, in our, in our com community that we live in, right? Our town. We struggle in high school, fitting in. Everybody does. Belonging is such a thing that whether you're 88 or you're one years old, you can understand the concept of desiring a place where you feel love and love is belonging. And love is one of our values, love, charity, and esteem, right? And as a teak community, that's what we should aspire for is to love one another and make each other feel belonging. Black History Month is just a larger universal version of that. It is literally a month that says, there's a whole group of people that have not felt that they belonged in America. They belonged in the economic prosperity that's occurred here. They feel like they don't belong in the fabric and the culture of this country. They don't feel like they belong in, you know, the life, liberty and pursuit of happiness values that we've always said we're after, right? And so it's a month about black history, black present and black future. And it's about people asking for belonging for over 400 years. <laughs> I think that's a lot of patience. And yeah. I think there's a lot of concepts there. And um, I remember making a post, emotional post on my Instagram, and I said, you know, for those that desire to go do this work, they will, and those that don't, won't. You know, for example, <laughs> I don't want my daughter to come home with an other person, somebody that I don't try and belong with and understand. That's not the time to deal with your otherness, right, or dealing yeah. with people in a, in a different category. Like, we should get ahead of that, because our world is looking different every day, and and I think um, that's kind of what we can start with Black History Month. I think it's a great month to really learn about the stuff I never learned about. You know, I remember feeling awkward as one of the two Black kids in my school, you know, in U.S. history in high school. And we talked about the slave ship and Black people packed into the slave ship. And that was it. On yeah. to the next thing. Yeah. We won a war. We, USA is amazing. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Let's keep winning, right? Um <laughs> But like two years ago, I heard about the Black Wall Street thing. Yeah. If you, don't, if you don't know what Black Wall Street is, look it up. That's an example of Black people not being lazy, building their own community, building their own financial structures, and it being wiped away in one night. Right. So, I mean, it, it's, it's crazy to me that at 20-something, I was just learning this. Um, and I have a very different approach to, to you know, how I move in the world. And so... I think that's the value behind it is, is understanding and learning and finding a way to stop seeing everybody as other and start belonging more. And it starts with like really learning and sitting with uncomfortable 
you know, emotions and feelings. Absolutely. And, and I, I'm a white man in the middle of rural Indiana, right? There are certain things that I don't have an opportunity to, to experience or to see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I, I love having these conversations. I'm very appreciative that, that you were willing to have the conversation. Are there, you know, I know there's a lot, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of authors that focus on these topics. There's a lot of, you know, there's podcasts out there. Are there specific resources that um, for somebody who wants to try and learn a little more and, and understand a little more that, that you might point to or, or direct them toward to, to get that process moving along? So the first thing I'll say, I'm going to give you the anti to that question okay. is don't expect black people in your life to be teachers. Right. Right. I think, I think that would be the, the first lesson is if you have a black friend or a black son-in-law or they may not be the person that wants to expose you to this world, right? Yeah. And, and this is not just based on a question you're asking, but if I wanted to get good at organizing my 401k, I do the research to learn how to organize my 401k to get the maximum profit. Right. And so if something is of value to you, you'll find a way to close the gap on that information. Um, I, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos today about you know mlk right like there's nothing i'm gonna say on this subject that mlk hasn't said and there's hours of documentation of what he's done i was just in atlanta in november and i got to go to the, the dr king center and it was mind-boggling i didn't realize coretta scott king immediately after her husband dies turns his street that he was born on into a national park which means the u.s government is part of enabling the King legacy to live on for generations. Imagine the strength of that woman, your yeah. husband just died and you do all this work to gather his philosophies in a nice package way um, to get the word out there. So I think MLK is somebody that we take for granted um, too far often, he's a great starting point. Um, there's a gentleman, doctor, I believe he's a doctor, Dr. John Powell out of San Francisco. He has a center of belonging, um, John A. Powell. And he's more about looking at how we get people to see each other as human beings and seeing, you know, ourselves in each other, right? And so, and there's Bell Hooks, you know, Bell Hooks is a writer who recently passed away out of Kentucky. And uh, she talked a lot about love and what that means. And she has a lot of great stuff on the, um, on the YouTubes and the internets. Yeah. Um, and then I've been listening to a lot of uh, uh, Virgil Abloh. He was the immense creative director for Louis Vuitton. He passed away a couple months ago and he was actually of Ghanaian heritage, my country from Ghana as well. And so I've been listening to a lot of him talking about moving through corporate culture and like mentoring others because that's what I've always done. You know, I was charged by one of my mentors to mentor. And um, yeah, that's a long answer to your very no. short question. That, no, that's great. I, I, I'm glad I'm glad you said what you said at the beginning, because I, I've, that's something I've heard. I've heard a lot of people say, especially in light of everything in the last two to three years that have really drawn attention to some of those issues, which is don't don't put it on right the 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 black people in your life to try and bring you into that go out and, and make the effort to learn and so I'm, I'm glad you said that. I think the 401k analogy was was perfect so um, I'm glad you brought that up and and I appreciate sharing a little bit more about some of the, the people that you follow and some of the people that you've done done the the research and the homework on as well um, if you would I, I'm, I'm curious uh, can you take us to Wisconsin? 20 years ago. I mean, what I, I just, I, I'm, you, you can get into it as far as you want to, but what do you remember about that transition and about your childhood? What surprised you? What stood out to you? Things that just to this day, right? Maybe looking back, you're like, holy cow, how did, how did I get through that? Or how did I assimilate to that? Like what, it, just take us into that a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. I mean, that's a massive question. And we right. can talk about that for like three days. It's, it's, um, own, it's own podcast series. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, it was, it was the greatest gift my parents could give me. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have the resources to take care of my mental health, my, my emotional health, my financial health, but that gift and that gift of going to Wisconsin opened up my world in, in a unique way. And, and I say that with a grain of salt, right? Like, you know, there's this saying something along the lines of like the ends justify the means. I don't really believe the ends justify the means, right? I'm a great product of co two continents. And I literally went from a lake house in Northern Wisconsin last summer. And two days later, I was in Ghana speaking a totally different language in a totally different culture, right? Not a lot of people can do that, right. what I just did. 
Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. At the same time, I'm, I'm aware of the turmoil I went through, right? My parents were separated, so I left my mom in Africa, who was my best friend and is my best friend, to move here. What does that do to a kid at 11 years old, right? I, I was exposed to a different kind of English. I spoke the British English okay. back in back in Ghana, right? And then you're, you're learning all the swear words the first couple of days of school. <laughs> I use it at church. My youth pastor gets mad at me, right? And so there's a lot of things happening. And I think as a child, I turn into a bit of a social scientist. You realize quickly, like you have to analyze the game, quote unquote, or what's going on around you. And then you find your space within it. Um, so throughout middle school and high school, it's just, it's always been this constant seeking of identity as an African born, you know, black kid grown up in this, you know, world that I don't look like anything and, and you know, any of the values that are here. I'm not the version of beauty that people are attaining to. I'm not what a smart kid looks like. I'm not what the top athlete looks like, right? So what do I do with that? And I think college allowed me a place to deal with that swell of emotion coming out of high school, right? Like the teak house was a place where it was my laboratory. It was my social laboratory. And I had guys, you know, put their arm around me and say, hey man, you're acting out, right? They didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing, but they gave me a place where like I could play with what I was feeling and experiencing till, you know, the raw product started getting, you know, worked on. Um, but fast forward, man, I, I feel like I'm a very dynamic individual. I speak three languages. Um, the day I get married, I'm sure 95% of the men up there will be white men. And that's just where I grew up, right? Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I've traveled to 11 countries in, in my lifetime. I get stopped in Mexico to take pictures with people because I don't see black men often. <laughs> I've been stopped in a village in India to take pictures with me. I've had, you know, people see my African clothes. I do African Friday at work. Okay. So since my first internship in 2014, I wear African clothes to work. People stop like, oh my God, I love that shirt, right? And my whole thing was I spent so much energy moving to America trying to fit in yeah. that I rejected myself and was rejected in the process. Now I'm at a point where I'm working on loving myself more and spending energy, really falling in love with my identity and who I am. And then allowing that to play out wherever I go. Um, I, w I drove to work here in Connecticut the other day and I'm blaring, I'm blaring my music outside the office, right? This would have never happened a couple of years ago, but I'm at a level of confidence now where I can do whatever. And one of my coworkers, much more senior white gentleman was like, I heard this noise, I know what it was. I turned around and I saw it was you just having the time of your life in the car. That moment couldn't have been a larger chasm of difference. But that day, he helped me get through some stuff at work. We, we collaborated on multiple stuff. And it didn't affect our ability to go into that building and do what we have to do, right, as engineers. And so I sit out to say, yeah, this, this journey I've been on has been wild. Um, anybody that's been through a similar story, I, I really would urge you to do the work to be there for your inner child as an adult and heal, right? I, I'm in therapy every week, and I think it's like a mental health gym. I do the work every day. And so that allows me to just embrace and enjoy this life more. It allows me to be more present and more intentional. And so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been an amazing journey. And uh, thank you for asking that question. Absolutely. And, and I, wanna, I wanna look at uh, when, you, when you join Teak, what we know the number one reason that people join fraternities is not for the parties. It's not to meet women. It's, it's because they feel a sense of belonging. And what was it? You mentioned the chapter looked completely different when you left than it did when you got there. But what was it about the chapter and about the fraternity that made you feel like you belonged in that group in that moment? Um, it was the fact that I wanted to walk away from the fraternity multiple times because there were individuals and moments that did not resonate with my value system and my morals, right? And I, I was like, how can a guy like that be a part of this family that I'm right. trying to join? And every time I try to walk away, there's somebody that always saw that, hey, this guy is special. He's special in terms of a human being. He's special in terms of, I'm sure selfishly, helping our chapter go to another level. We need this guy. Like, let me go talk to him. Let me talk him off the ledge, right? And so I think there was a lot of moments where like, I really was ready to give up pledging and being in a fraternity. And it was the right individuals, right? Like, you know, and I can name names all day, uh, but it wouldn't even matter. Like they know who they are. Um, they're the ones that met up with me at 5.30 in the morning at a diner 
to have a conversation. They're the ones that stayed up with me till three in the morning while I cried. They were the ones that, you know, were with me through all the highs and lows of trying to pledge and even later on in my college career. So I think that's, that was a difference maker for me. Yeah. The, the last question I have is uh, related back to some of the DEI initiatives and uh, in your experience in the T chapter, bringing that chapter and, and increasing the diversity there and, and finding, finding p- individuals that uh, may not have been present there when you got there and, and bringing them into the chapter. What can, what can our chapters do? What can our members do to increase and in, in just better value diversity in their groups? And, and diversity could be uh, home country. It could be religion. It could be socioeconomic background. But what is it that you really focused on that allowed you to do that at Zeta Zeta? And, and how can we apply some of those lessons to right now? So I think that's part of like my core value system, right? Like I knew what it was like to be left out, Yeah. right? I'll tell a quick story. I was part of ESL, English as a second language. They put every foreign kid who comes into town into that program. I spoke perfect English. I was in that program for seven years, but that's not the main point. There was a woman, a girl at that time, a woman now named Nicole Sandoval. She was from, I believe, Bolivia. She had a quinceanera or equivalent of a quinceanera. When you turn 15, you become a woman and you have a party. She invited, right, all of the white kids in our grade and and then some. And I didn't get an invite as a kid in her English as a second language class. And I remember the next week feeling left out when everybody was like, oh, my God, remember that at Nicole's party, we did this. And and I was like, wow, even the kid in my English as a second language class that was supposed to be a little foreign family didn't invite me. So I know intimately what not belonging feels like. So that was the permeation. That was a place that I recruited from, you know? And I feel like a lot of people that haven't felt left out most of their lives, that's something you're gonna have to deal with at some point, right? Is understanding like, you know, not everybody has that healthy support system throughout their lives. And you should allow Teague to look however it looks for people, right? Like my whole thing, and this ties into the current committee I'm in with alumni, you know, advisory board, I think there's a place in TEAG for alumni that want to be almost zero involved all the way up to alumni that want to be 100% involved. There's a whole spectrum here that we can take advantage of. Same thing with having a chapter, right? There's a whole spectrum on college campuses of guys that are really smart, guys that are really athletic, guys that are um, really musical, guys that are worldly, guys that are um, talented with with their hands, guys that are poor. Guys are from impoverished backgrounds. Guys are differently, you know, differently abled, right? There's all these different ways to be a university student, a college student, a college man, a frauder. And you're just starving yourself by having carbon copies of what you look like and sound like and like to do. There's 8 billion of us. And I'm pretty happy that everybody's not like me because it'd be very boring to walk outside and be like, I want to eat. Oh yeah. I know what you want to eat. Yeah. I want to do that. I know already like that would just be a lack of growth for me and a lack of opportunity. So I really enjoyed getting to know a man from Saudi Arabia intimately. It's a very secretive country. I've never met any Saudi Arabian since I left college. But in that time I had about eight Saudi Arabian friends that changed my life. My, my fraternity brother from Mexico took me to his family's home. His aunt made me breakfast. His cousin gave me uh, this painting of Pikachu, right? And, you know, you can see this. Like, that's a story in itself yeah. of, of the richness that you can experience in those four years and afterwards. And so to all the people sitting there advising college, you know, chapters or in those recruitment meetings with slideshows of faces saying, boo, he can't pull girls, or boo, he's not good looking enough, or you may have walked away from a dynamic individual, like in my chapter, I won't put him out out there, but there was a gentleman that he loved metal music, he loved cats, and was a little different, but to this day, it's one of my favorite frauders, absolutely one of my favorites, because when you spoke with him, you got to enter his world, he showed you his music, he showed you things that you... He told me about some king of some country that was, I can't remember the name, King Arthur the Blind. And he goes, guess how he died? There was an arrow shot out of him in battle and he didn't see it coming. And I was like, oh my God, like 
where did that come from? That made no sense, but I laughed, right? Like, and those are the moments that I remember now, you know, almost a decade since we met, right? And so, yeah, it's a big world out there and I get it. People that don't want to change and leave what they know, there's a value there, right? It's like the roots in a tree. There's a value in deep roots, right? Yeah. Nutrients and water and familiarity, but I'm more of, you know, the, the branches, right? I have these tentacles that go out to India and Ghana and Wisconsin. And, and I walk into rooms across the world and I get so much love that that's what reminds me that there's something special about this human experience, right? And so I just want to give those people a hug that can't see it, you know? And um, it's almost like trying to explain the color red to a blind person. It's just not possible. Yeah. Well, uh, I think what, what I'm, what I'm hearing is, is empathy. It's to boil it down. And that's something that I feel like if I could give the entire world one quality that they, that everyone could have and practice at a high level, it would be empathy. Cause I think that's where we lose sight of that ability, right. To branch out, to meet new people, to try new things. When you get rooted in your own experience and you don't look at the world through the eyes of others, that is, that's the, you know, I mean, right. We can, this is a, a deeper conversation, but that's, I think that's a lot of the challenge of what we're looking at right now in the world is just a lack of, of empathy. And so uh, that, what you just said, that's what it, it spoke to me. I, maybe others take something different from it, but I, I appreciate you getting into that and, and sharing that. I really do. Yeah. And I mean, it's my honor. It's my honor to be here and, and talk through this and yeah, I wish everybody well. I wish everybody success and health and, and as they pursue the next goals. And, you know, I really believe in, in this brotherhood and, and what it has done for me and, and many others and what it will continue to do. Um, you know, I hope in some small way I can, I can give back what has been given to me. Absolutely. Well, I, I cannot thank you enough, Kobina. Um, it's been fantastic. Uh, certainly hope that uh, a lot of people take advantage and take the, the half hour or so to, to listen. Um, and certainly we will, uh, we'll have to find some time to, to do this again. I mean, I, I think we, we scratched the surface on a lot of things. Um, and there's, uh, there's, there's some more digging there. So I, uh, I'm down whenever, man, just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch and, and we'll make it happen. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. And one final gigantic thank you there to Kobina. Um, just blown away really by the inside and, and the, the words of wisdom and, and the kindness and everything that, that he shared with us. So I uh, hope that you listened to that. I hope that you pulled something out of it as, as I know I did, as I shared that I did. Um, that was a really, really cool conversation to have. And, and I'm hoping that that energy came through as you were listening. That is all for us this week on the Teak Nation podcast. As always, please ensure that you have smashed the like button, that you have subscribed, that you have set up notifications to all six of your email addresses, including Hotmail and AOL from your days in high school, so that you never, ever miss a new episode of the Teak Nation podcast. Thank you all for listening. We'll talk to you again next time. Have a good one.